<laughs> four and a half months, that's how long I've uh, been here. It feels like it's been longer somehow, but four and a half months. And uh, we're about to hit the holidays, or maybe more accurately, the holidays are about to hit us. And uh, I thought it might be time to uh, check in, see what we've been up to, and see where we are going. Since I've gotten here, we've been doing a lot of foundational work. Um, and I've been very thankful for like the teachers got together with me, the teachers in the congregation. We put together this plan for discipleship. For, and so to have a plan, always good to have a plan. I, I've met with the musicians so that we can put together, make sure we're, we're developing uh, music, uh, having more people playing, uh, having some special music during Christmas. So I've been very thankful for that. The board, we've been working on how we function as a board, and they've been putting in uh, an amazing amount of work figuring out how we went to this simple uh, board model this year, and, and we've been figuring out things like, how do you hire someone with this? We, we know how we used to hire people, but we had to figure out how we were going to hire people under this approach. And so we're figuring out how do we do things. We put together a budget, which is always good to have, good to have a budget. And if you're interested in, a budge, in, in our budget, Lori Wilt, after worship, will be uh, explaining, giving everyone the budget and all the numbers, and, and if you want to have any questions about how this church uses finances. It's all public data, and Laura will, Lori, there are three L's that are all blonde on the board. Laura, Lor, Lori, and Lisa, and I, I might have a problem keeping the name straight sometimes. I apologize. Um, so the board has been doing great work on our and your behalf. Uh, we have also just finalized our safe sanctuary setup. Um, if we do need to we are now no longer going to do online training. Uh, December 3rd at 9.30, on, that's a Sunday, on December uh, 3rd at 9.30, we'll meet over there and we'll do safe sanctuary training for anyone who needs to have that. It will take 15 minutes, if that. We would just come, I'll tell you what you need to know, fill out some forms, done. Uh, and then if anyone else needs to be safe sanctuary trained, that's how we take care of our children safely. Um, I'll do that as needed. No more creating logins for the conference website. Um, we have had to respond to some unexpected situations that have arisen. Some have been frustrating. It turns out I, I got a call that the state actually de-licensed our preschool and, and aftercare program unexpectedly. Well, they expected it. We didn't get the memo. And so uh, Dee and Chris and myself did, did some work to make sure we could, you know, open. So uh, that was an unexpected uh, challenge. We've had some uh, some wonderful unexpected situations arise. Uh, Lauren Blackford is going to have a, a child. First grandchild? Wonderful. This is a wonderful thing, right? It does mean that she had to step down from aftercare, so we had to figure out how to hire someone. And uh, tomorrow, uh, Chandra Sutton will be our aftercare assistant, which is just going to be great. Uh, then those four can have their mother with them even more hours in the day. <laughs> um, we have drank a lot of coffee together. I appreciate the time that y'all have spent sitting down and drink coffee with me. There's still some of you I haven't had that opportunity yet. I'm getting to you, and I look forward to it. And hopefully we've been getting to know each other better, not just you and me, but, but each other. If you, some of you remember getting up and playing in circles and, and the question, who, who do you know least well in this church and how can you get to know them better? Uh, I hope that that is showing so, some fruit. So that's where we have been. Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we, if we understand where we're going, we've got to understand what our, our mission is. Well, what's the purpose? Why do, we, why do we gather? The mission of the Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That, that's our mission. And we, that is what the, the church around the world has chosen to articulate, how we articulate our mission. And that's what uh, the General Conference decided. Every year, we send someone off to annual conference, which meets annually. And then of those 800 folk that gather down there, they send 30 off to general conference that meets every four years, and they put together the Book of Discipline, which is the book that guides how we, we work together. 
how we live. And uh, in paragraph 120, it, it, this is our mission that we have agreed to as a church. The mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Local churches provide the most significant arena through which disciple making occurs. Now, next paragraph explains where they came up with that. They say, uh, Jesus' words in Matthew provide the church with our mission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, there in my name, and teaching them to do all I have taught you. And further, that uh, the greatest commandment, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, being and mind, you must love your neighbor as yourself. And so they take the, these two verses, the great commandment and the greatest commandment and the great commission, and they put them together and, and, and just make them a little bit shorter, and that's where we get. The mission of this church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Have you, have you all heard that before today? Is that a new, new language? Well, get used to it. You're going to hear it a lot going forward. That's why we exist. This is the question. Anything we do is based on this. And to unpack it just a bit, when we talk about making disciples of Jesus Christ, that is both making new disciples and deepening the discipleship of us who are here, because we are being saved daily. I mean, yes, you choose to follow Jesus at one point in time, but it's not like, that's it, done, you never have to do anything else again. We are being saved daily as we follow Jesus daily. And so we are called to be a community that invites people to choose to follow Jesus, and then to be the community that helps people to follow Jesus day by day, so that we are becoming ever more Christ-like. And so that, that is the first part of the, the mission, um, making disciples. And we expect that of each other, right? A year from now, you expect me to be a year more graceful and wise and patient and kind and Christ-like. And a year from now, I expect you to be the same. If a year from now we're exactly where we are right now, we have failed at this mission. We are called to always be becoming better disciples of Jesus Christ. So the first half, uh, make disciples of Jesus Christ, and then the second half is for the transformation of the world. Love is both a noun and a verb, right? There's the noun, the warms and the fuzzies, and everyone loves warms and fuzzies, but that is based upon the verb. You choose to love someone. You choose to act for their best. You choose to do what is good for them. And you can choose to love someone even when you don't have the warms and the fuzzies, right? We choose to love people, and it's a practical matter. We choose what is best to do what is best for them. So we feed the hungry and cure the sick and clothe those who are naked. We do the work of, of, of charity and, and justice. Charity is helping someone who's broken. Justice is looking at why they were broken in the first place. And, and to, so to transform the world to be loving our neighbor, it, it's both. If we got to take care of those who are hurting and then ask, why are they hurting? And, and do something about that. Every church is called to be an embassy of the kingdom of God where God's abundance is experienced and people walk in and know that they are loved in practical, real ways. Now, that all should be forward, straightforward, right? No, no one, any questions about that? No, no, no real problems. Jesus said, uh, go forth, baptize people, make disciples, and love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. That, that's great, right? Amen. The challenging part is how do we discern how that guides what we do, right? How, do we, how does that work? How do we bring people into following Jesus, helping people who don't already follow Jesus, choose to, and then deepening our own discipleship? And how do we transform our community for the better so that we are the answer to the prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? And, and I, I find, for me, the, the way I use those, those two of things is uh, I, I need to ask, so that. If we want to talk about doing something, we need to be able to say we're doing this so that, right? If anything we do as a church, if we're going to do this great program, we need to be able to say we're doing this so that more people will be able to follow Jesus and here's how we see it happening. We're going to do this so that these people are not going to be hurting anymore. We're going to do this so that these people will not be hurt in the future. We, to be able to say we do this so that, it, it helps us be clear about we're, why we're doing something. And if we can't say we're doing this so that, if we don't have an answer for that, maybe we shouldn't be doing it. 
Because right? if we don't have a so that, then we're not really following the mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And, and this is something that is essential. Like, if you open the hood of a car and you don't see an engine, is it much of a car? If you look at a church, it might look like a great church, but if it's not making disciples and transforming the world, then it ain't much of a church. It is essential to who we are, is to be making disciples and serving others to love and transform the world. So what do we do? What do we do? Uh, here are some of my ideas on what we do next. In 2018, I believe it is time for this church to look outside of the church. Most of this 2017, the latter half 2017, has been focused inwards. How do we understand ourselves as church? How do we understand worship? How do we understand that this is a wonderful, spirit-filled, gracious place to be? And it is. How do we now then look outside of the walls? For me, what that means is I need to get out into the community. I need to go meet folk. And if you are at any meeting, whether it is as formal as a school board meeting or it is as informal as the cards down at the bar on a Thursday, I want to go to it. You invite me and I will go with you. Because if I just show up at cards down at the bar on a Thursday, what's going to happen if I don't know anyone? They're going to look at me like I'm stupid. But if Alan brings me in and, and, and introduces me, ah, right, then, then I've been brought in. And if I go to a school board meeting, how is a school board meeting if a random guy shows up with no agenda? Yeah, everyone looks at him and goes, what's his deal? Is there a problem? What's going on here? If someone brings me and introduces me and says, this is Andy, then, then oh, he's here to so, Introduce me to your people. Help me know the community. You know people outside this room, yes? Right? Bring me along. I play nice. I don't bite much. <laughs> so that's what I need to do personally. And what I believe we as a church need to do is, is be create an event we can invite people to. We have this great parking lot out there. And I've been ex so excited about that parking lot since the moment I saw it. And you think, oh, it's a parking lot. No, it is not a parking lot. That is a place we can create an event and in invite the entire community. Because if we create an event, we put food or music or a movie, we can turn that into an outdoor drive-in parking, th uh, drive-in movie theater. I know how to do it. It's possible, right? You just hang a big old sheet from the big overhang, get some big speakers. It, we need to create an event that we can invite the entire town to. Because if you invite people to church, what do they think? Right? If they walk in this door, I might like whisk them up and baptize them or, or yell at them or something, right? Inside this room is scary because they haven't been here. But out there, it's safe, right? You invite people to go and, and have an event outside, and you can invite, we can invite the entire town. And we invite them for a specific reason. We invite them so that you can be hosts to them. Right? If, if everyone shows up from the town, town of about 2,000 people, I'd expect between two and 300 people to show up. And so we invite people to get together, Blanket the town, invite people, free gift. This is grace. This is what it means to be church. We love you. Show up. And if we sit with people who are, who we, if you sit next to anyone you're sitting next to right now, we'll have wasted the event. Because what we need to do is be hosts. And who does the host pay the most attention to? The person who is uncomfortable. Right? And so we can create a big event and so that you can go and talk to people you have never met before. Or reconnect with friends that you haven't seen in years. And you can say, hey, my name is, I'm so glad you're here. And people are going to offer to give money for it. And you'll say, no, this is a gift. Please just receive a gift. The church loves you. Right? If we do an event, if not two of them, maybe three of them, I don't know. Maybe we'll figure out a series. If we create an event that we can invite the, the entire town to, and then we have a set of Sundays during the year that we get genuinely excited about. Is there a Sunday coming up that you might be excited about? Anyone get an email? This look familiar? Right? Cookies coming up here? If you have a Sunday you can invite a neighbor to, and if they've already been to an event out there and they know that we're not scared and we genuinely love them, and we love them enough to put on an amazing event to give to them, if you then invite them to come have cookies and you pick them up and bring them and buy them lunch afterwards, they might do that. 
And why would we do this? We would do all of this so that people will be in here to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if they're in here with friends at a church that they know that loves them, they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have loved them. They have heard the good news. And they go, ah, right? Following Jesus is not some abstract thing that they might hear about. It becomes the way that they become part of a community, this family that loves and supports them as a church ought to do. So I would like to, personally, I need to get out, bring me along. I'd like us as a church to create an event, uh, one or two events a year to invite the community. And then we have Sundays throughout the year. We uh, have special music. We create an event with our youth that we can invite people to that we are genuinely excited about. And then uh, next, I believe we need to be serving somehow. I don't know how. I haven't figured it out yet. We haven't listened to our community. I would like to have a roundtable sometime in January or February, February where we invite the leaders of this community. Uh, cops, fire, government, uh, superintendent, school, uh, business leaders. Get them in the same room so we can invite them to talk about what are the challenges facing this community, how might we be working together on them and then we as a church can look at the list of what comes up and we can say that's the problem we're going to take a swing at right we can't fix everything in shelbina but we better be taking a swing at something because a church that's not serving somehow ain't much of a church right we have to be serving somehow in, in this community and, and to go off half cocked and say oh we'll just go do this no we need to listen to make sure what we do is going to help and part of that is us learning some more about how to help wisely. Uh, and during the Lent season, we're going to look at a book called Toxic Charity, because the reality of helping is we might mean well, but if you give someone, okay, I give you something for free once. Great. I give it to you twice. Ah, now it's a pattern. If I give it to you a third time and then I stop, what have I actually done? Have I really helped you? Or have I created an expectation and then I don't follow through on the expectation that you're bitter at me and I'm confused at why you don't like me anymore and then, right? We haven't actually helped. Charity become, can become very toxic if we do not handle it wisely. And so during the season of Lent, we're going to be, uh, I'll be preaching about this. How do we help in a way that truly loves our neighbor, not just serves that person? And then on Wednesdays, we're going to be looking at uh, Ruby Payne, what every church member needs to know about poverty. Uh, Robert Lupton wrote the book Toxic Charity, and I'm looking forward to that. So we can have some of these hard conversations, because, you know, it's always good to say we're going to help people, but then you get into the brass tacks of how to help people, and whoo right? We have to do it, and we have to do it wisely. So that's what I, I, I'm looking forward to uh, next year, the outside of the church. Any questions about that? That's a non-rhetorical question. If, if any of that didn't make sense, I want to know. Does that, that work? Okay. We do have some more work to do inside the church as well. Uh, D does a great job with the junior high youth program. I would like to, we're going to be looking at those who have volunteered to be uh, work with youth. We're going to be looking at how do we bring uh, others alongside of her to uh, both serve K through five and, and high school. That'll be something we're looking at next year. Uh, in the weeks following Easter, uh, between Easter and Pentecost, we'll be having a membership and confirmation class for those who are seeking to join the church uh, as teenagers or, or c come to the church as adults or just know more about the Methodist Church and, and join this, this church. Uh, what we will be continuing to examine our stewardship of uh, what we've been entrusted with, our skills and our time. We have uh, the survey, we, we have figured out how we're going to respond to each of the groups, how you've each volunteered, and so that's coming. And so we will be having more people involved in worship, more people involved with music, more people involved in visiting, and, and that's wonderful. Um, especially the visitation part. I have not done a good job of keeping track of visiting people in the nursing homes and the homebound. I'm aware of that. I, I just, I, I need help with that, and I'm very thankful for those folk who, who have uh, volunteered to, to help me, help us as a church do that and, and finally uh, one thing we need to look at is it, for the church is how we handle our I'm gonna say the word money in worship everyone brace yourself relax right money right we're gonna have to make sure we continue to think about how we handle our our finances Lori will be presenting the budget of the church and she handles it very wisely I'm not gonna get into numbers that's Lori's problem thankfully not my problem uh, what I will say about money is this 
The need of a grandparent to give is greater than the need of a grandchild to receive. Is that true? Right. The need of the grandparent to express their love, to be someone who loves, is greater than the need of the grandchild, because how many toys can any grandchild truly have? Right? <laughs> it is the same way when it comes to us. Our need to give is greater than the need of the church to receive. Here's why. We have been given so much. Right? Is there anything we have that is not a gift? Even this building, this building is a gift from those who have come before us, and it's an amazing gift. Right? Everything we have, we have received as a gift. And the correct response to receiving a gift is, say, is to immediately say thank you. This is the concept in Scripture of first fruits. You give your first fruit of the harvest as a way of saying thank you to God who gave you the harvest. And so I need to be a thankful person more than the church needs to receive the money. Because if I am not being a thankful person, then I'm holding on to things a little bit too tightly that are not originally mine. Right? My, I need to be a person of gracefulness and thankfulness. And then the church does need to pay its bills, and it's good that the lights are on. I appreciate that. But out of that uh, understanding, this church has, in the past, had people of great thankfulness. And we have a few dollars in the bank, and Lori will tell you exactly how many dollars we have in the bank after worship. This has built up reserves in a way... What seems to be the case is the faithfulness and thankfulness of a previous generation is crippling this generation's thankfulness. Right? I believe that every generation is called to be thankful and to give as an expression of our thankfulness for all that we have been given. And so what I'd ask you to do between now and January 1st is to examine your finances and make a plan. That's what the Kuhn family is going to be doing as well tomorrow. I won't be in the office tomorrow, Deb, sorry. Uh, what we're going to, Olivia and I, mostly me, is going to be sitting down and looking at our finances, making a plan so that we can figure out what we're going to do to be thankful people. And, and what is the next step for us? What, what some potential next steps would be if I give X many dollars a week, Maybe I need to make sure to give that even when I'm not here, make up weeks I'm missing. Maybe it's saying I figure out that I give this percentage, maybe I need to go up a percentage. Maybe if you're tithing, it's time to make an estate plan, or maybe it's time to go beyond the tithe. For the Kuhn family, uh, God has been very gracious with us and for us. And um, next year, we have been tithing since we got married 11 years ago. And next year, the plan is we're going to go from giving 10% to giving 11%, uh, split between three churches here, Honeywell and the Catholic Church, because my life is complicated. But uh, I invite you to sit down and make a plan as well. Look at your finances and decide how will you be thankful next year. Right? And my concern is more for your character so that all of us are gracious and understand all that we have is a gift, right? That's what I'm concerned about. So, I've now talked about money. Is everyone still chill? No one's, like, going to run and stone me or run me out of the church? That's it. I'm not touching money again this year. You've heard my piece. Uh, there, are <laughs> there are questions that are unanswered. There are things I don't know the answer to yet at all. Like, we have spent some time drinking coffee together, which has been wonderful. I, I've served two appointments now. This is my third. And I know myself. I know what happens in year two and three is that I need to find better ways to maintain relationships with you. Because there are some of you I've, I've had coffee with. And if, if I don't or we don't figure out a way to make sure I'm still chatting with you, I won't chat with you for the next year or two. And that's just such a bummer because I want... Y'all are fun. There are still stories I need to hear, right? So I need to make sure that we continue to maintain the relationship between pastor and congregation, especially as we continue to grow, um, because that becomes a challenge as well. And, and also, I, I need your input on how we do this. Um, it was fairly straightforward me to, for me to say, we're going to do a State of the Church Sunday, and I'm going to tell you the State of the Church. Okay, you're here. Great, this worked. If we're going to do this yearly, do you want to do this like this and, and take a Sunday and do it? Or do you want to go have a meal and do it? Or do you want to have coffee after worship and have this type of discussion? You tell me. I, I don't, 
I'll do whatever you want. You just tell me how you want to handle this. But we do need to make sure that on a regular basis, we are sitting down and seeing, saying, this is our mission, this is where we're going, this is how we're doing, so that we're all on board and we're all moving in the same direction. That this is all possible is because of your commitment to Christ and your faithfulness, your willingness to grow in that faith. And, and so I'm just deeply thankful for each of you. I'm thankful that we are going to get to do this together. Uh, it, some pe- sometimes you get up and you say you have to go do your job. I get to do, go do my job. My job is to serve you, and, and I get to do it every day, and I'm deeply thankful for that. It is an honor to serve as your pastor, as we get to be part of the inbreaking kingdom of God, being a place that follows G- Jesus' faith as we seek to become a church that is younger, more diverse, and ever more vibrant. Thanks be to God. Amen.